Humphrey for in listen only mode. Hello, I'm Ernie Humphrey, the CEO of Treasury Careers. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to join us for our webinar today, leveraging rolling forecasts and scenario planning to manage uncertainty. I would like to thank our webinar partner, Centage, whose strong commitment to thought leadership helps us make this webinar possible. 2018 has already shown us that markets can change drastically and unexpectedly. Don't let your 2018 budget be a strategic anchor on your company's ability to anticipate, respond, and react effectively to dynamic market conditions. Today, Steve Player, Program Director for the Beyond Budgeting Roundtable in North America, will show us how companies are moving beyond annual budgets to replace them with better methods to achieve management's objectives by separating the various budget purposes, target setting, forecasting, action planning, and resource allocation to more effectively achieve each one. Critical to this effort are rolling forecasts and scenario planning. Steve will explore rolling forecast best practices and the different ways scenarios can be considered when developing contingency plans and allocating resources to be ready for the future. Before I delve into the content, I'm going to offer a few quick words about Treasury Careers, cover a few housekeeping items, and then I'm going to welcome our featured speaker, Steve Player, to the webinar. Treasury Careers offers content and resources that empower Treasury professionals to own their career success. I encourage you to vi visit us at www.treasurycareers.com. Now for the exciting housekeeping items. For those of you interested in receiving CTP or FP&A credit via the AFP, you'll need to answer all polling questions and remain on for the duration of the webinar. If you have any questions regarding CTP or FP&A credit, please send me an email at ernie at 360thoughtleadership.com. We'd love to hear from you today, so we encourage you to ask questions in the questions box of your GoToWebinar control panel at any time during the webinar. We'll do our best to get to your question during the Q&A session at the tail end of the webinar. Fear not, if we do not get to your question, we will follow up with you directly after the webinar. Finally, we appreciate your consideration in taking the short survey at the end of the webinar, as we always strive to improve the ROI we offer our event attendees for their valuable time. It is now my distinct pleasure to welcome Steve Player to the webinar. Steve served as the Managing Director of Live Future Ready. He also leads the Beyond Budgeting Roundtable North America, working with companies to implement continuous planning processes. Steve has over 30 years experience improving performance management. He is co-author of Future Ready, How to Master Business Forecasting and Beyond Performance Management, as well as five other books. Steve serves as a Financial Management Senior Research Fellow for the APQC. He also interviews CFOs for this at CFOThoughtLeaders.com website, discussing innovative and planning processes. Steve, the floor is yours. Please take it away. Thank you, Ernie. I appreciate that introduction. It's a pleasure to be working with you again. Um, let me start real briefly by explaining to everybody listening in what the, our, our tagline, Live Future Ready, means. As we've got into planning and forecasting, we're always trying to you know, look forward in many cases is some people trying to predict say we're trying to predict the future but as we all know that's virtually impossible to do if we ever found somebody who could predict the future we'd probably go straight to the commodity markets make a few wise investments and uh, make enough money to retire but the really the everything we're doing with planning with budgeting with forecasting is all those things are really trying to help your organization be ready to to live in that future that's coming at us. So uh, it's really what we're trying to do. And, and our ambition is to help organizations do a better job of that. Now, um, one way we do that, quite frankly, is by focusing on dumb stuff that we seem to find that we're doing in finance uh, that just doesn't add as much value as it needs to. And, and I'm sure if you've had any time at all in finance, you've experienced some things that you, when you look back on, you say, boy, that was some dumb stuff. I wish I didn't have to do that. And in many cases, we find that happening over and over where dumb stuff kind of comes in quite regularly. So that's what we're trying to knock out, and that's what we're trying to move to. Let me jump into today's agenda because we've got a lot to cover here in, in the hour. There will be some times for Q&A, but I find if you'll ask the question as we go through it, uh, it'll be better positioned when we come back and answer it. And if for whatever reason we run short of time, it'll help us position uh, uh, and get back to you in a written response. Really, when we look at 
planning, forecasting scenarios and those kind of things, you have to really think about the world today. And what we're experiencing today is really a world of uncertainty. So we'll talk about that. And then we'll look at how budgets deal with that world of uncertainty to see you know, what's the typical response. Then I'll get into four key things, which is really the heart of the seminar, which is the four ways to improve your planning. Four practices that if you do them well, uh, you'll get a much much better outcome in your planning effort uh, and we'll talk through those and how they fit with each other and then we'll get into some Q&A. Let's jump into the world of uncertainty. When you look at it today, you know, I'm nervous as a cat about the stock market. I'm sure you may be too. Uh, we had a nice long run. It's gone quite well, but uh, lots of headwinds brewing up here and it's not just a, the typical break in the recession. Um, we got a we got a wild card in the presidency. His number one economic advisor could you know couldn't go with him, so he he bolted. So you know, market is really nervous right now, not knowing what's going to happen if we go with pull war trade wars, which are certainly a distinct possibility. We'll see if they're light or if they're heavy. Um, we seem to have gotten past the nuclear threat, but I think it's going to come back to haunt us uh, fairly quickly because we never resolved any of the problems. It still lies out there with all the conflicts and and. It amazes me. We always live in a conflictive war. There's the world. There seems to be a war going somewhere all the time. Uh, the Middle East continues to be a hot spot. Uh, the Korean Peninsula is certainly to watch out with it. With Russia's latest forays uh, back into nuclear weapons, we seem to go, be going a long way away from the, the era of, of Ronald Reagan and the winning of the Cold War. Uh, Europe in light of Brexit, whether you're on the, the British side or the European side, it's just a whole lot of question marks and a lot of uncertainty. Uh, our U.S. political instability, we certainly have seen that. when We had elections here in Texas yesterday, so that's front and center. Our trade conflicts, and even in social media, has, has accelerated the speed of uncertainty. Um, I used to love to watch Charlie Rose. Uh, I thought he was very informative and a great interviewer, and he disappeared overnight. Um, the, the, there's a lot of microscopes in the world today that are looking at a lot of different things. So uh, the one thing I know is is uncertainty is rampant everywhere we go. So let's jump to the next topic. We'll talk about how the budgets deal with that. So if you've got uncertainty in your business environment, the most typical response from finance is to try to prepare an annual budget. And you find what happens in this situation where you're trying to reach an explicit target uh, coming up with a plan to do that requires, at its heart, making a tremendous number of assumptions about what's going to happen in the world. And you're actually trying to forecast at least 12 months into the future, in many cases even before that, because you haven't got to the year yet. And you're trying to think about what your world is going to look like. And then based on that, how are you going to develop a plan to, to, to execute that? That. In many cases, that becomes what we're going to execute. We keep marching in that direction, even though most of the assumptions that those plans are based on continue to fall further and further out of, out of place. And so we take all that and we, we kind of swirl it around. We create a funnel. We create some assumptions, and there we go. And then, you know, quickly, all that becomes out of date. Um, if you look at that and you think about it from a manager's point of view, if you're one of the, if you're not the CEO or the CFO, if you're not the senior leadership getting the output of that, if you're somebody that runs a department or runs a division, how do you protect yourself against all that uncertainty? And that's what leads to some of the really bad behavior that comes in the budgeting process. If you go to the next slide, Ernie. Uh, it really, what happens is in many cases you try to hide some cookies. You try to find some places where you don't. You're not just transparent. You're trying to to basically keep yourself keep yourself some cushions so you can deal with that uncertainty. And uh, managers often talk about that's the only prudent thing to do. But the reality is, what's happening is everybody's not trying to make the organization run optimally. They're trying to protect themselves with a series of cushions. They're 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 arming themselves so that with, that if it comes back back to cost cuts or things that happen that, you know, they've got places that, for that to come from. So in many cases, the budget is an extremely poor tool. If you think about it, the budgets are based on 1920s technology. The basic blueprint for budgets comes from uh, James McKenzie in 1922 in his, uh, his book, Budgetary Control. If you read that book, it's, we're still following the same basic blueprint. Now, we've sped it up quite a bit. We've got computers and we've got the cloud. We've got all kinds of things that speed that up. But the fundamental heart of the of the approach is still the same, and that's where we find a tremendous amount of of, of issue with it, uh, and come to the conclusion that in most cases traditional budgeting is just not fit for purpose. It doesn't do what you're trying to do, so that leads us into first then thinking, all right, if it doesn't do what it's trying to do, how do we think about this differently? 
So let me, I'll talk to you a little bit more about what's wrong with traditional budgeting, then I'll get into more about wh wh how people move forward. If you think about it, you know, how many budget iterations do you go through? I've seen some people reporting that best practices is three iterations. Well, it, it seems really odd to me that the best practice includes at least two rounds of rework. I've seen, you know, I've heard of companies doing nine or 11 back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And when you think about it, it's a rework. And what happens is the field submits and the corporate says, well, that's not good enough. You need to redo it. Field adjusts and modifies, submits again. Corporate says you're getting closer, but that's really not it yet. About the third time the guy in the field looks at the corporate guy and says, hey, why don't you just tell me what answer it is you want? I'm tired of guessing. Corporate looks back and says, I can't tell you that. It wouldn't be my, it needs to be your budget. And field guy says, it quit being my budget three times ago. It's your budget now. And so this back and forth, not only being wasteful and, and, and taking a lot of time, it also destroys any kind of ownership or accountability. So you wind up with a budget that's a negotiated plan, again, based on a bunch of assumptions that we don't know if we're going to be right or wrong. Sometimes we're going to assume too low and we could have reached a lot more. Sometimes we're going to assume too high and we may kill the organization trying to reach it. And it just causes you to sit back and say, isn't there a better way? Can I come up with a better design that, 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 that approaches the planning process more effectively? And that's what we're finding. And that's what I'm going to show you here in, in, in just a second as we move forward. One last, a uh, couple last points I want to make is, if you think about it, how long are your budget targets good for? This was some early research we did in conjunction with America, the APQC. Uh, and we looked at how long the budget targets were good for. And the thing that's most stark to me is the four to six month column. Less than halfway through the budget year, two thirds of the respondents said, hey, those targets are out of date. Uh, and so it led me into the question of asking people, how long is it before your budget targets are out of date? Now notice I said out of date, I didn't say keep using. I know a lot of people use out of date targets and they keep marching to them because that's what their bonus is based off of it. And, and a lot of organizations will screw themselves up doing that. If you think about it, how long before they're out of date? And when I did them in seminars, you know, the times would keep getting shorter. Some guys said one month, two months. Another guy said, you know, uh, you know, they're out of date as soon as we printed them. Another guy said, hey, we're, we're, ours are in two weeks and they're already out of date. And I said, well, why don't you fix it? And he said, no, because we don't know any better. We don't know what it's going to be. And again, again, you're making assumptions and having to predict across that. And that's what you've got to figure out. How do we overcome? How do we do something different than that? If that's not good enough to help you build a case for change, let me give you a couple more refer kind of research points and, and, uh, and let you have those. This is my list of 32 items that people have complained about budgeting. The first seven uh, came right out of the BBRT literature, the big seven that takes too long, costs too much, based on assumptions nearly always wrong, erodes the ethical foundation of your organization by creating gaming, all kinds of bad things. Worst case, it causes unnecessary spending instead of controlling it, gives you the illusion of of control and in words of Jack Welch, it just sucks, sucks the big energy and idea out of the organizations. I expanded that for one of our software vendors and added another five about flexibility and so forth. And then my good friend David Axon came in and chipped in 20 more from his book, uh, Mythbusters. So think about these and use those to jog your memory about how you feel about budgeting. Also, write down what you like about it. Uh, for those people who like what budget do, if you're, if you're going to do something different, you need to make sure that you, 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 you achieve what you like and compensate for that. So write about that. What's wrong and, what, and what's, uh, what's good about it? And a lot of people will say, hey, I can tweak it and fix that. And the next slide shows you what happens. They'll go to better budgeting. They'll try to, you know, they'll start with top-down targets so there's not so much up back and forth. They may compress the time so there's less negotiation and so forth. Uh, they may, you know, oftentimes, they increase the, the level of detail, go down to the chart of account level. And the only thing more detail does is give you more and more places to be wrong. Uh, you're much better off focusing on the key drivers. And they get a lot of people involved. And the result of this is it feels better. But at the end of the day, it's the same results. You notice my picture on that uh, previous slide is a bunch of musicians standing on the deck of the Titanic. They're still playing the music, but the ship's still going down. And I want you to think about that and think about the tweaks you're making. Is it really going to make things better or are you going to do something differently? And the problem you have in terms of, of, of doing something differently is the uh, – the uh, the they still fail. It's still based on assumptions. Over and over again, it's it's based on the assumptions that all turn out to be wrong. Um, so when you think about it, let's then think about what we can do differently. Uh, how can we avoid that bad behavior? How can we move to something different? Um, 
So let's let's begin to break it apart. So in our next agenda slide, let me take you through these four things. And I'm going to take you through them kind of step by step because uh, they're really critical. The first thing that really helps if you're going to try and improve your planning is if you'll take and think about what your traditional budgeting process does and separate it, literally pull it apart. If you think about budgets, we use them to set targets, in many cases pay rewards to reach those targets. And we want those in many cases to be aspirational, to be, to be reaching for the stars. But then we come back and we use it for planning and forecasting, which is really trying to give us a realistic picture of where we are. Now, when a realistic picture, we don't want reaching for the stars. We want a realistic picture to tell us exactly what's going to happen. So immediately you begin to move away from this. Once I have tied incentives to reaching for the stars, now I'm starting to talk about what's practical. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, the incentive comp creates a, a, a conflict. When I look at you know planning and action planning and so forth, I get down to what am I going to do differently? How am I going to control my resources? If I think about it, I also use that budget for, in many cases, measuring and controlling, seeing whether people are doing a good job. Well, I find if I pull those th those four things apart, I can find better ways to do each one of those. And that's the heart of what the Beyond Budgeting movement's about and what Live Future Ready is getting toward is finding better ways to achieve these things using the power of computing, but not just using them to speed things up but change and make things more effective. And that's what we're going to take you through is, is really what we're trying to do. So the improved goals and target and rewards, we want to self-impose goals. You know, you really shouldn't have to have management beating you with a stick. Uh, the organizations we've seen are, are far more empowered. And in many cases, what management's role is, is, is making sure they're holding back and not getting too aggressive. So if you get really good organizations, you don't have to, you don't have to be the energizer bunny running around beating people up it really pulls everything forward. In terms of forecasting, we just want continuous views. We want to you know, get rid of this big spike annual budget workload, instead go with rateable continuous reviews in terms of what their lighter touch, driver-based rolling forecast that show us where we're trying to get to. Resource allocation, it's not a once a year big bang. You got you to negotiate and get your share of the pie. Instead, it's focused on what is your cost per output? What is the value that your organization, your unit is producing? And if, that, if the request for that production goes up, more money flows your way so you can get the resources to hold those service levels. Flip side is if the request for that service goes down, you likewise need to be giving up resources to free them up and move them to the, air, the part of the organization where they're needed. So we create a much more flexible resource allocation. And then measures and controls were much more holistic, looking at trends, looking at, at how we're getting better and better as we go forward. Now let's talk a little bit and talk a little bit about the target setting and reward. <clears throat> in target setting, in, in most cases, we will be better off if we would switch instead of using annual targets, if instead we'll use the strategic plan to give us a direction of where we're trying to go, if it'll point us forward and we'll start moving toward a more of a midterm target, kind of three to five years out and, and moving that direction. Because what happens, the next slide illustrates is once we start, even though we have a five-year plan, we put that magnifying glass on the first year, and that's all anybody ever talks about after that. Let's go get our money in the first year. And years two, three, four, and five all kind of disappear. So you get all kind of short-term abort behavior just trying to make this year's number instead of really thinking about where you're trying to get to long-term. Uh, I'm going to give you a way to reward things in just a second, but let's let's shift the target setting and move forward. If you think about it, you know, if, if, if I'm going a certain direction, if the economy is good, if the wind blows hard, I ought to sail as fast as I can. And if I take make my target of uh, three years out, I want to target so far out that it's impossible to get to in any given year. And the reason I want it out there is I don't want the goal to be getting to the target and stopping. In most situations, budgets become stopping points. I want you always striving, doing the best you can. If the wind's strong, sail fast. Likewise, though, if the wind doesn't blow at all, if, if, if all of a sudden this trade war we're about to embark on kicks off and we go in the tank, it's going to be a lot harder to get there. So break out the oars. We're still going to where the strategic plan says we need to go, but we have to get there in a different kind of approach. So think about making yourself flexible as possible, but, but moving that consistent direction in terms of where you're trying to head to. Now, before we go on, I want to ask, turn it back over to Ernie. Let him ask the polling question about rolling forecasts, which is one of our key topics. Ernie? Thank you very much, Steve, for your fantastic content and insights. Asking you to share with us if your organization currently uses rolling forecasts. We appreciate everyone's consideration in answering all of our polling questions here today. 
Just a reminder, those of you who are interested in FP&A or CTP credits for today's webinar are going to need to answer all of our polling questions. Also want to remind you that we can take your questions in the questions area of the GoToWebinar control panel. We have a tremendous opportunity to tap the knowledge of a world-renowned expert today, so I want to make sure that you take full advantage of the opportunity to, opportunity to tap into Steve's tremendous knowledge. So I'm going to go ahead and leave the polling question up for another few seconds. Then I'm going to go ahead and close it, and then I'm going to share the results. And this will help us kind of set the stage where the audience is relative to rolling forecasts as Steve pivots his content towards rolling forecasts. So I'm going to go ahead and close that. Go ahead and share the results. And just taking a quick look uh, at the results. Uh, Steve, do you have any initial thoughts on the results? Um I'm extremely excited to have the 40% regularly using them. That's kind of already there. Um, and I, I, if I roll this back four or five years, we would have seen much more on the upper side rather than the lower side. Uh, for those of you who answered C about we only go to the end of the year, I've got some slides specifically coming up for you in terms of what's out there. If you're just, just getting started, but you're planning, or if you're not started yet, but planning, hopefully I'll give you some tools and techniques to use in terms of in terms of what to do and what not to do as we go forward, because that's that's coming up next. I'm, I, I think we've got a, a very knowledgeable group. I'm happy to have them on board here. All right, thank you, sir. Let's get back to rolling forecast. So let me jump into the rolling forecast because there's a, there's a ton of content around this right now. In the rolling forecast, I put this slide up, and then I could use this as my last slide too. It's kind of the capstone. I wanted to foreshadow where we're trying to get to. If you think about it, we're in the upper left-hand corner of this slide. You've got a rolling forecast, which means we're looking out five quarters, or we could look out six quarters, or so forth. Every time the green box comes in, when we add another month of actual, another quarter of actual we'll roll out that consistent horizon. So that's one thing we're looking at in a for rolling forecast. The horizon is always consistent, and it's based on how much visibility does our organization need to have to be able to change and adapt for the things that are coming, to be able to adjust our plans, to be able to start new initiatives if we need to, just how far out do we need to see. Now, in some industries like high tech, that might be a very short window. Telecom is a good example. Other industries, it might be long term, might be eight quarters or even further. So really the, the planning horizon is dependent on how much visibility you need to see. But it's moving continuously around this wheel where there's never an annual spike. There's just a constant plan, act, check, see where we are, plan, act, just keep going and going and going. The forecast tells you whether or not your, your, your plan is coming to fruition, but you're just moving continuously. It's, it, it, the best analogy I can give you, it's a lot more like sailing a ship. If you think about your people in operations, what do they care about year end or quarter end? It's just a date on a calendar. Now, in many cases, we've trained them to care about this, and we've trained them to do some weird things, like blow out things just to try to make a quarterly number. But it's not the natural order of an operation to, to do that. The more natural is, you know, if, you, if you're a lean operation, if you're trying to be most efficient, the natural operation is a smooth, rateable flow. And what we try to do in finance is we can match that. We, our life gets a whole lot better. You know, our, our, we don't spend as many nights and weekends up in the shop trying to get the accounting spike taken care of. It gets a whole lot smoother. So let me let me take you through some common pitfalls, and then I'll come back to kind of how we put the rolling forecast together. Now, if we had more time, uh, maybe I'll have to come back sometime, Ernie, and do a, the, the top 10 pitfalls, because this is a quite humorous presentation I do that, that talks about 10 things that people mess up on. Uh, uh, and I'm only going to cover the first two here in the interest of time. If you like any of those other Ten that you want, put it in the question box, and we'll try to give you some more insight on the other the other eight uh, uh, in the in the Q and A time. But number one mistake I see people making is the people that answered C, which is forecasting to the wall. And what that is is you go out and you go out two or three months, and then you you forecast, but you only look to the end of the fiscal year. You go out five or six months, and then you forecast, but you only look to the end of the year. You go out nine months, and you forecast, but you're only looking to the end of the year. That's forecasting to the wall. And that's the same analogy as if you bought a brand new car and you turned the lights on the first night you owned it and you saw a funny thing happen. The light showed out about 1,200 feet, but as you put the car into drive and began to move forward, the light horizon didn't get any further. It kept collapsing into you. It went from 800 to 600, almost to the point of total darkness. And when you were almost totally dark, it jumped out another 1,200 feet. And that's what, that's what happened when you're forecasting the wall. 
what you want to do instead is move to a rolling forecast where I've got a consistent horizon. The problem with forecasting to the wall is the question that you're asking. Forecasting ought to be about seeing where you are and where you're headed, okay? What is the run rate? What are we doing? When I ask the question, are you going to, or where are you going to be at the end of the year? We're not asking about visibility. We're not asking about run rate. What we're asking is, you agreed to a budget number. Are you going to hit it or not? Everybody forecasting the wall knows that it really doesn't matter where you are. The question really being asked is, are you going to hit your number? And so they quickly learn that the answer to that question is yes. Because if you answer no too many times, you're going to get some help from corporate. You really don't want any help from corporate. If you answer no too many times, you get to you get to watch somebody else do the job. So what we're trying to move to is something that's really about true visibility. So we go to this consistent horizon that constantly updates. So that's pitfall number one, avoid just forecasting the wall. Number two, equally as damaging, is definitional. Confusing forecasts with targets. And this is, anything I say today, this is the most important. Don't confuse forecasts with targets. Targets is where you, targets are where you want to go. You think about your strategic plan. You think about your, your vision for your business. The target is where you want to go. It is the point on the horizon. It is the destination. The forecast should not be that number. The forecast should be the run rate, the projection of where you're actually going. You want to see where my organization, where is this ship actually heading? And to the extent that the ship's not going to where the target is, that's what you need to understand. You need to understand that gap and be able to move to a corrective action. The next slide, I think, shows that pretty well. If the projection says we're only getting 6%, but our target's 10% growth, if we don't change anything, we won't hit the 10%. So we've got to immediately, if we've got a shortfall, we've got to figure out what are our countermeasures, what do we do to build ourselves back, to step ourselves up to hit that target. And a lot of times when you're planning those action plans, this shows the stair steps. In many cases, you might plan to be actually above that target in case everything doesn't come in exactly as you thought it might be. There's always uncertainty in whether or not your action plan is going to do it. And when you take and break your action planning down this, this is the real heart of planning. Planning and forecasting is not about bending curves and making numbers magically line up. Planning really ought to be about the hard work of figuring out where we're headed and why we're headed that way and what we need to do if where we're headed is not where we want to go. So what kind of new projects, new initiatives, and so forth do I need to launch? And when you do that, you can ask some much more profound questions about whether or not you're going to be successful in implementation. Do we have the right manpower to be able to take on this new action plan? Uh, does the action cause us to interact with our customers and what reaction might we expect from our customers? If we take these actions such as a price increase or something or a change in terms, what are our competitors' lack likely reaction going to be and how are we going to deal with that? So much better planning comes about when you get to this understanding of where you're different and how you're closing the gap. And that's really what you've got to focus on is, is really figuring out the trends. And that's where the hard work is. But when you get down to it, once you get the things up and running mechanically, you have target. It's out there on the strategic plan. We get it. It drifts as we get. You know, it floats up or floats down based on the strategic plan. The 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 business produces how it produces, and then we're just constantly in the mode of figuring out how do we close gaps, how do we get more effective, how do we get more efficient. So once we get this infrastructure set up, and that's where the software comes in and makes it so much easier, is we get mechanically where we can handle this very easily. Then we get into thinking about what do we do to make the business better. And that's where the real operational improvement comes when you can think about it that way. So now moving forward, when we talk about forecast, the one key thing is to focus on driver-based forecast. A lot, of, I cannot tell you the number of forecasts I've been asked to review. And I go look at them, and they look like ratioed income statements. I mean, they're just a, they're a bunch of numbers. There's some percents up, some percents down. There might be a little bit of an explanation. But there's just this kind of, you know, uh, it's, it's a table of data, if you will. If you really want to get good at planning, understand the algorithm of your business. Understand what your key drivers are. What are the big activities that you're doing that really move the needle in terms of your value added? And how do you interact with your customers? How do you acquire your customers? How do you move them through your pipeline? How do you convert value? And when you what you're trying to focus on is building a logic diagram, and we can go into in later seminars, we can go into deeper detail about logic diagrams. What the logic diagram does is show you how you you really convert from you know from one to the other, all reaching all the way back to where you're you're guarding your customer universe. You're, you're looking at your lead stream. You're bringing down uh, your your likely candidates. If you think about it in terms of, of sales, 
if you don't have enough leads, you're likely going to miss your sales target. So you get some fairly early predictions. The further back I can build my predictive logic diagram, the more early warning I get to know whether or not things are going to be good, to know whether there's going to be a gap or not, or, or know whether it's going to be an excess. If there's an excess, I equally want to know that so I can take advantage of it. What additional investment should I make? What what things could I do with that additional margin to be able to, to acquire more market share or to make an acquisition potentially or really help myself in the long term? So uh, you really get into a better state when you're when you're looking at the key drivers. So really, really critical part of, of what you're what you're trying to tackle. OK, uh, so from our driver base, it then leads us to the the uh, the next part of coming back to, uh, you know, forecast versus targets versus plans. In the next slide, you'll see that, that really, whoops, back one, Ernie. Uh, Got to go back one. I'm not quite ready for the poll yet. All right. Sure. Go there ahead. we go. That's what I'm looking for. Again, the way this kind of comes together is is my forecast, you know, my actual results are coming in. Based on that, I produce my dotted line forecast. And the forecast is where my drivers and the analysis indicate that we're going. So in this case, as you can see, based on my projection, I'm going to come in under the target. Okay. Target's still up there where we'd like to go based on the strategic plan, based on how much progress we've got to make to be marching to where we, we, we need to be, maybe based on what we promised the ownership in terms of returns and so forth. So that's what we're shooting for. And then what we fill that gap for, before I showed you in terms of boxes, now I've filled in the boxes. What's the playbook? What are the action plans? What are we doing to climb the ladder to be able to move that together? And that's the essence of really what we're trying to tackle. Uh, and the greater the uncertainty, the more the gap may be and the gap or the excess may be, the more flexibility or the more challenge we may have. Now, in extreme situations, you asked the question, you may have asked the question earlier when I went through that about an inability to predict the future. And there's nothing I can, you know, if, I, if I figure out how to predict the future, you'll read about the me and the commodity market. But so far, I haven't found anybody that could do that yet. So in the meantime, we've got to figure out how to live in a world. We've got to design a system, a planning system, be it budgets, forecast, uh, whatever you want to call it. I'm not too hung up on names, but we've got to design a planning system that can contemplate and react to this, this volatility. And so in most cases, we just don't know. We don't know what the political environment's going to be. We don't know if the economy is going to keep soaring or tanking. So what that means, if I'm going to live future ready, if I'm going to be able to sleep as a CFO, if I can sleep soundly at night, what it means is I got to put together a plan that helps me understand which way I'm going to go, what I'm going to try to tackle, and so forth. So that takes us into in scenario plan. But before we got that, we got before we jump into that, I think we've got a poll about that topic. Ernie, uh, thank you very much, Steve. I was just excited for the polling question. Uh, so uh, we're going ahead and uh, asking you to, to kind of set the stage for us a little bit, so Steve can get an understanding of where your company is at in terms of leveraging scenario planning. Uh, I recently was involved in an FP&A survey, and to me, it was very surprising uh, how many companies uh, weren't were not able to easily do uh, scenario planning. So I'll be interested to see um, what our survey results look like there. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to leave our polling question up for another 10 seconds or so. Then we're going to go ahead and take a quick look uh, at the results. And then we're going to go ahead and transfer the content focus to uh, deploying scenario planning. So I'm going to go ahead and close the polling question. And I'm going to go ahead and share those results. And uh, Steve, what do you any thoughts jump to mind here? Yeah, uh, it's it's real interesting. We begin to slide back quite a bit from from heavy use of rolling forecasts. So this scenario playing is one of the more advanced things that you get to later. So uh, the, the again, our forty one percent is item D there in terms of we have a base at a higher low. And I'm gonna in the next part of the presentation, I'm gonna go a little bit into why I don't think that's enough. A lot of people that I mean, we got a more advanced group listening in, which is good, but uh, uh, for those of you who aren't doing things, it's something that we need to tackle. For those of you down at 10% that, that, that are leveraging the robust scenario plans, I'd love to chat with you guys because our business is really helping companies learn from each other. And if you're up there doing robust plans, it, that, there's some the great companies that, that would like to learn from you and vice versa. So um, let's certainly chat afterwards. What we're trying to do in scenario playing is we dive into this, and this again comes from uh, education. American Express uh, primarily provided this slide for us. What you're really trying to do is figure out if something happens, 
if a certain scenario, a certain upside or downside happens, what would be the result? So American Express used this chart to analyze, it's kind of a waterfall chart, and they used this to analyze what would happen in the event of a second Gulf War. They knew from the first Gulf War that wars, if you're in the travel business, that's really bad for your business. People quit traveling and they quit spending money when we go into war. So they had to estimate what would happen. And so the downward, the gray steps marching downward are the kind of bad things that happen, the causal impacts. Now, not content to just let their P&L drop to that low blue bar, then they had to think about, what if this happens, what do we do instead? What's the management actions? The yellow steps are climbing back up to try to get back to where they wanted to be. So what can we do instead? So essentially what you try to do in, a, in the scenario playing is to create a, a management playbook to mitigate the risk uh, of, of the uncertainties and the, the downside risk, but also you use the same kind of thing to take advantage of the upside because, you know, the old Chinese proverb about chaos is also opportunity. So every time that you think about things having a downside, think about where the upside is because there's always going to be a winner whenever there's a loser in most cases. So you want to be able to position yourself to come out on the winning side in terms of what's out there. So when you really think about it, the playbook example I talked about is really important because what we're really trying to do is understand the action. So as we get into this, uh, most of you fall in the base case, plus or minus of a high or low. In most cases, the higher lows are typically stated as a percentage, 10% or 20%. Uh, what I want you to do is far, far more robust than that. What I really want you to do for scenario planning, because it's a very, very powerful tool, is I want you to develop multiple scenarios. You ought to have at least four to seven scenarios uh, that's out there, and they ought to be some good and some bad. So much more than just an up and a down, I want you to be thinking not only about the general economy going up and down, but also think about very specific things that could happen to you. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. But I want you really to dig in on, on multiple scenarios and start with item B there. I want you to start with a scenario where you take your planning team and your operating people and you decide what could make our business so good we couldn't possibly spend all the money we're making. Now, I'm not talking about up 10% or up 20%. I'm talking about up so good you couldn't spend all the money you're making. Sort of how Jeff Bezos feels right now. At $100 billion, I don't think he could, he in 100 lifetimes could spend that. Uh, but what, what, make, what would make your company that good? And I find in finance, it's an exercise we rarely ever participate in because we're always, you know, we're always the cautious people. We're always looking for the downside risk. But I want you to open your mind and think about what would cause us to go up. What new product would you introduce? What new customers would you find? What would you change about your business to be able to make so much money you couldn't possibly spend it? Now, the flip side on that's number C. I also then want you to turn around and go the exact opposite. And I want you to go to the extreme downside. I want you to think about what scenarios could happen that would cause you to think about bankruptcy. They would threaten your very existence. Could, could bankrupt the company. What are those downside risks that uh, that you really got to protect against? Because if they happen, they're very, very deadly. Okay. Now, that, don't get me wrong. I don't think in any given in any given situation, you're going to have a scenario where it's such up you can't spend the money, or that you're going to face bankruptcy. But my purpose in suggesting these two extremes to start with is to open your mind to thinking. I want you to think about the highly improbable, the impossible. Scenario playing first uh, first got widespread talked about when the use by Shell. And one of the things Shell did is Shell contemplated oil prices way different than what people were thinking and way below what anybody thought was possible. Uh, a good friend of mine, John Miller, was uh, was working at uh, Smith International. He's the head of strategic planning. And oil had hit $130 a barrel, and he said it'd never go below 100 again. Thought it was on the way to 200 and then within three years it had gone to $10. So the oil business is what I, 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 being from Texas, it's an easy one to watch, and it goes up and down, uh, no clockwork to it. When it, people think it's going down, it'll go up and vice versa. It's just, it's wildly unpredictable, and its extremes greatly exceed what most people think are realistic. But allow yourself to think about that, that, that you, know, there, you know, what would happen downside and upside, and if it happened, how could you counter it? And what you'll typically find when you go through that exercise is in the upside, what holds you back from making so much money you can't spend it 
is it usually the new product or a new distribution channel or something new that requires an investment of money. And then that investment of money uh, is usually the limiting factor. If you flip it around and you get to something, you've, and I've certainly worked with some of my clients that were on the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, the, 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 I was working for an oil field pipe manufacturer that uh, had to live through that $10 oil. And at $10 oil, not too many people are drilling, drilling for it. So they had to survive that extreme downturn, and they were on the brink of bankruptcy for quite a while, but they made it through. And, and we learned a lot of lessons of kind of what they went through. When you get really close to bankruptcy, you forget fixed costing and variable costing. You get to cash costing. You know, how much cash does it cost to make this, this thing ready for sale, and how much cash will that bring in? And if it brings in more cash, then you likely do the exercise, be it sell a piece of plant or equipment or a fence or whatever's not nailed down, because you're trying to raise enough cash to breathe. Cash is the oxygen a company breathes to survive a downturn. You're trying to pile up enough to be able to hang on until times get better. Now you think about that upside, it needed cash too. So if you go through this thinking about the extreme up and the extreme down, what I think you'll find is you'll find some good ideas that could move up. You'll also find some idle assets and things around that could be liquidated that might provide the capital to invest in some of those ideas. So the real advantage for a planning department having gone through this exercise is to just take a few of those things to free up the cash, invest those in a few of the high probability projects that you looked at in terms of what made things so good, and see if you can see if you can start moving the ball a little bit quicker before you ever get into trouble. So look at those. Now when you're working right through those out of D is you're looking for the issue, the opportunity, what causes it? What causes it to become an opportunity? What causes it to become a threat? Uh, and, and really trying to get a deep understanding of what is behind it. What does Brexit mean to your company? What is what is a, a, a volatile political environment mean? What does a trade war mean? There's so many things happening. What you're trying to figure out is what did, what the potential things could mean, and then what should we do about it? You're also looking for leading indicators. When I understand what's causing something, what I want to find is something in the economy that becomes a leading indicator or predictor that that, that opportunity is becoming more likely or that threat's becoming more real. Because the leading indicators tell me how fast I need to move. And if I have a good advantage of seeing a leading indicator, I'm ready and able to move quicker than my competition. I often get the jump that secures the victory. The hardest part of the scenario plan then gets down to part F, which is the building the game plan. And depending on the scenario, what you're trying to do, you run through a series of actions that you'll have to take to protect against the risk, to defend, or to take advantage of the opportunity. So you're, it literally is like a sports team. You're putting together your playbook of what you can do to raise cash or to, to maneuver. Or what can you do to, to take advantage of that? And that's at the heart of the whole thing. So let me take you through and let's, let's explore some, some scenarios. Upsides everyone should look for in our, in our roundtable, uh, our companies that meet together, we talk about these kind of things of what is it that we should look out for in terms of, of uh, things that could go go great. You know, competitors going out of business, for instance, uh, new product with rally better results than you thought it was going to be, uh, new sales or distribution channels, and all of a sudden, rapid, you've got a proven product, but now I get it in a new channel, and all of a sudden, it grows geographically, or it grows into a new industry that it wasn't in before. Uh, uh, opportunity to buy a key competitor to consolidate the market. Now all of a sudden you got less competition and, and more flexibility. Uh, flip side is maybe a key resource comes available to you. Uh, I'm headed over to the UK to celebrate our 20th anniversary of Beyond Budgeting. And one thing I'll, uh, my sons are coming with me, so I'll have a chance to uh, to show them Salt Air, which was one of the early textile mills when the Industrial Revolution swept across England. Salt Air became wildly profitable because the fur by the uh, the wool by who was behind it uh, ran across Apaca uh, down in South America. The, the Apaca uh, had a very silky kind of wool, and he basically bought a few bales, brought it back to the factory, and had his guys work with it. And after two or three years, they figured out how to weave it. Once they figured out how to weave it, before he told anybody about it, he went back to South America and bought up all the, all the Apaca production that was being gone. And so for quite a while, this, this salt air mill had the exclusive on Apaca. Uh, and it, it just revolutionized. They had the hot new product. Nobody else could get it. And they made wild profits that, that really built the company and built a lot of what they're trying to do. So again, the unexpected thing that you're looking for that you can run with. That's, that's you know, think about the things that give you the upside potential. Now, let's flip over. You also got a whole series of these and probably easier to find a lot of downside risk. You know, 
you know, cause you know, customer goes out of business or customer consolidates and, and suppliers are put on notice. There's going to be a bidding war, the key commodity in many cases with the trade wars, it's going to get a lot more expensive or be in short supply, uh, political unrest, you know, certain, some countries, you, you know, you have to think about, do we want to be there anymore? Uh, environmental, there's been a strip back of regulation, but I think that's going to boomerang because I think if you're you're skirting the, the the edge on regulation, I think it's going to come back with a vengeance. So be very very careful with that. Uh, if your competitors merge, you know, uh, there's a lot of industries where there's a lot of consolidation. So be thinking about your generic ones and how you prepare to defend. Okay, uh, then from there you look for that leading indicator. What what tells me it's coming? And it's it's kind of speeding the response. You're trying to get together, and then that drives you forward to putting together your playbook. Your playbook is, is literally a set of things that you're going to do to, to better your position, to defend against the risk that coming in coming real, or to take advantage of an opportunity. Now, uh, a lot of people say, well, Steve, you know, there's only something, you know, we only have a limited amount of time. The reason a lot of people haven't got the scenario planning is because we're still doing too much dumb stuff with the budget. And, uh, and therefore, we haven't got time to really think through these things. The nice things about scenarios, if you'll do four of them this year, you can refresh that really quickly next year and uh, you'll still be right there and you can just refresh your plans. You don't have to do them all again from the top to bottom. So easy to refresh and you can keep expanding. Once you get to about eight plays, you know, eight to 10 plays that are different scenarios that you can run with, what you're going to begin to see is there's only a certain number of plays your organization's capable of running. You know, in that situation where the, the company had to raise cash, they could sell their idle assets, but they could only sell them once, you know, once, once they'd sold them, that cash had to be used and you had to get to a new place. So you think about it, uh, even if you have a scenario that comes that you haven't prepared for, you'll have your plays, you'll have your scenarios that are similar to that, and you'll be able to mix and match, and, and you'll be quicker on the response in terms of what's out there. So a uh, key thing to being living future ready is being able to, to just shift and adjust because you've thought these things through. And, a CFO can never go to bed not knowing he's predicted the future, but he can sleep comfortably knowing that whatever the future happens, he'll be ready for it. So it brings up the next slide that, that we always have to ask is just, are you ready? You know, the number one thing we're trying to do in planning is make sure we're ready. And that's not about filling out a schedule or making sure it ties and reconciles. We got to do those kind of things. But we're really trying to make sure we're ready for whatever comes at us. And that requires finance not to be standing at the back of the boat, looking at the past, doing the recording, saying what the score is. It requires us to get up there on the bridge beside the captain, beside the operating people, and actively contribute the decision making and the thinking and, and, and position ourselves in the knowledge we have about the business and about the metrics and how to understand the data uh, to what are the real decisions we need to be prepared for and what actions do we take as they move at us? And I got to tell you, it's a lot more fun up there thinking about what, how you can make things happen than sitting on the back watching them happen to you. So let me take us back to the next slide, which again brings us back to that recap, the little bit different version of the slide you saw earlier. We're moving away from this traditional top-down budget, which is, you know, you drive everything through a set of static control processes. Instead, we're moving to this continuous rolling forecast. We've, it's not just rolling forecast. I've seen a lot of people fall into this trap. If you just put in rolling forecast and you don't change anything else, what you're going to typically do is try to budget four times a year and you're going to kill your organization. Or you're going to abandon some of those things like target setting, like resource allocation, like uh, continuous action planning. And when you do those, you're not getting a complete picture. So rolling forecast is a key, but you need things like scenarios. You need things like revamp target setting. You need to pull that budget apart and think about those different purposes and then do each one of those differently. And then you're going to be able to move around this wheel where you're, you're going to be looking strategically, where are we going? How, you know, where, how are we going to get there? What do we need to do? Uh, how, do we, how does it position us? You know, what do we need to change? And then you run around, you put your plan together, your forecast is how well it's working, you're moving into action, you're trying to make your organization better, better. you're building, you're adjusting and adapting to what the competition's doing, what the market's allowing and so forth. You're checking to see if you're on target and you're just moving around that wheel continuously. Uh, and that's the really, you know, the, the difference in organization. In your slide that the next, uh, we'll give you a, a, a bit more about what Live Future Ready is really all about. 
uh, uh, we've got our planning palooza coming up in April the 30th through May 2nd. I'd love to have you come join us. Uh, you share a lot of the messages. Uh, love to have you uh, interacting. We're having a lot of fun uh, just talking about helping people figure out better ways to plan and control and, and working hand in hand in companies and helping them implement. So, um, uh, enjoy the opportunity. Uh, Synage is a company we work with a ton. Uh, the team there, we I think we've been working with them for about five years now. I'm extremely excited about the product and its capability to do rolling forecasts. Uh, the, the the one thing that has been satisfying over the last five years is as people have focused more on this, the tools that support us are getting better and better and better. Uh, they're cloud-based today. They're they're sort of lower cost. Uh, you've got security issues that there's ways to deal with that. Uh, so we're just very, very excited. The reporting's changing dramatically. Uh, it's just a very exciting time to be financed. Ernie, let's, let's jump into the Q&A and see what kind of questions we have. All right, great. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. I just want to remind uh, everyone uh, that we can still take your questions in the questions box of the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, and I have one question around, um, that someone has asked a couple people, a little more uh, color uh, maybe about uh, running into the wall a little bit. If you can share an example or a little sure. bit more color there. Well, the biggest problem with one, with, if you just forecast to the wall, it doesn't take your operating people, your finance people, anybody answering the question to learn real quickly that you don't really care about visibility. You care about, am I going to hit my earnings target? Okay. And so, you know, if, you, if you're just asking where we're going to be on December 31st, and every time you ask the question, that's all you care about, it's not about continued visibility. You really don't even care about the first quarter of the next year. You care about hitting that short-term earnings target. And everybody knows that, you know, if they're behind, they need to be talking about how they're catching up. And so what happens when you forecast the wall is everybody begins to, to sandbag and, and try to negotiate the lowest target possible and then try to make sure that they hit that number. And so the whole dynamic of planning changes when all you're doing is forecasting the wall. Uh, what you really need to be doing is, is understanding what this ship is capable of producing and how do I keep optimizing what it's capable of producing? How do I keep, how do I keep making sure that I'm, how do I make sure that how, what, what our output is, how does it compare to our peer group? You know, if, you want to, if you want to judge how well you're doing, don't judge it based on the budget because the, if you judge it based on the budget, you're going to reward the best negotiator. Instead, judge how well your company does or your division does versus the competition who are operating in the same environment. So, you know, if Walmart grew same store sales 4%, that's pretty good, unless Target announces the next day that they grew same store sales 6%. So it's how you perform relative to your competition that is a better measure of, of how well you're really doing it. It's not how fast you run, it's, how, it's, it's whether or not you ran faster than the other guys given the race conditions you were operating under. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, next question. Um, is there a general guideline on um, how often you should revisit your targets? Well, to me, I'm again, if I move to midterm targets, um, I, I want to I want to avoid revisiting my targets as much as possible, okay? Because the target is an aspiration of where we're trying to get to. If I push that off out instead of doing annual target, if I push my target out to three to five years, I don't have to adjust my target nearly as quickly because I'm contemplating some years the economy is going to be good and some years the economy is going to be bad. But I'm judging my move, my progress toward the target relative to everybody else in, in, in operating that way. And so I, I can understand if, if, I'm, if it's out three years, did I make a third of the progress? Was that, did I grow market share faster than the competition? How's everybody else doing in terms of growth and return and so forth? So um, if I push it out, I, can, I adjust it far less frequently. Uh, the big criticism a lot of people had about rolling forecasts is they felt they were changing the target all the time. You're not changing the if you're changing the target every time you do a new forecast, you're doing it wrong because the forecast is where you're going, the target's where you want to go. Where you want to go doesn't change every quarter. Okay, where you want to go stays out there fairly consistently. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, next question, uh, questions I've kind of seen a few around uh, driver-based planning. Um, can you give us a little color on maybe some best practices? in identifying and monitoring the right drivers and maybe issues companies might have in trying to uh, focus on too many drivers? Well, again, you have to think about drivers the same way Covey talks about big rocks. 
you want the drivers to be your big rocks, the big things that move everything that, that happens. So if you build a logic diagram, um, you, you want to focus on what are the things that, that are really critical to that. Uh, in our training, we have a, a, a seminar that works thing through a, a home building, co a home improvement company. And we track it from all the way from uh, you know, revenue being recognized due to installation all the way back through the sales process and from the sales process into the lead bank, uh, how it gets distributed and so forth, all the way back to the bombardment of the customer universe. So kind of one piece of paper, we see the full chain, the full side of the revenue chain in terms of what's happening. And we can see some key metrics that let us know where our levers are in that situation. In most cases, the companies are really driven by certain management decisions about how many salespeople they're going to have, uh, their policies around how many leads they were going to give each salesperson. But the driver really was the effectiveness of the sales team. Uh, and so if you can, the driver is the thing we look at. If we improve this, everything gets better. Uh, so you're looking for the if you if you're a Jonah fear of constraints person you're looking for where the bottleneck is where's the place you can apply resources to and improve the entire operation uh, so the bottle the fear of constraints is applied at the bottleneck but that's the reason you typically have to have a logic diagram to see the flow of everything to be able to to, to clearly diagnose where you're doing it and you do that by by you know building a flow chart and 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 the algorithm of the map of the business not by you know trying to trying to see it through a spreadsheet without getting behind the physical things that make the financial things occur we can dollarize anything but that doesn't tell you how it works to see how it works you got to understand physically you know how much work is how many how many sales leads the guy taking what's what's the process what's the conversion ratio and so forth and are we are we improving the sales process to make that better uh, i use sales because that that's usually if everybody says if it gets sales right i usually get the rest of it right so we like to focus on that in the training to help people think through how they would adjust it to their sales approach. Great. Uh, just one uh, final question to be mindful of our time here, and then we'll make some closing comments. And I'll also note, I'll go ahead and launch our final polling question during the last response here. So, Steve, you've actually, you know, been in, been on this uh, continuous mission, right, to get people to go beyond budgeting. So, as you mentioned, the anniversary is coming up. So. Uh, what are the barriers to adoption that you're seeing today, real or perceived, versus what you were seeing maybe even 10 years ago or so? Well, uh, the biggest thing we're challenged against is we're going up against 90 plus years of history. Um, people have been, you know, it took probably 20 to 35 years for budgets to get sunk in. But once they got sunk in, they got sunk in deep because uh, um you know, we were post World War II, and and it, was, it wasn't very hard to make money because we had a global economy out there, voraciously consuming anything America could make, good or bad. So uh, we we kind of led with and put that in, and it sunk it all in. And even though we've had problems virtually since we first started putting it in, we've just kind of always done it that way. And everybody loves the illusion of control. So the biggest challenge we have, 20 years ago, we still have today. Is we need senior leadership to really understand what's different and, and why what they're doing just will not work. And no matter how much they try to tweak it to make it better, it's not going to be better until they address the fundamental flaws that it's based on assumptions that are going to turn out to be wrong. And what they really need is a more adaptive system. Now, if that takes us, you know, calling things budget or using different words, uh, our move to live future ready is we're perfectly willing to do that. We'll call it wherever you want to call it but let's fundamentally think about a better way to plan and control in terms of what's out there. The big plus that we've got that we didn't have uh, is we've got so many more examples of companies that have done it. Companies like uh, TW Telecom and Naveen White, who's our executive in residence. Naveen implemented Beyond Budgeting in 2004 and ran a public company without budgets for, uh, ran the planning function of a public company without budgets for a decade. Uh, excellent expertise and she's available she's part of our staff and she comes help coach and train and teach people how to do this uh, and, and we get finance people to change uh, in many cases the you know, system has made it very very cumbersome the systems today are, are getting are fantastic and getting better so we got more computing power now than we can absorb so strongly recommend people focus on improving their process and getting it right and then overlaying the automation to make it go faster and more effectively Fantastic. I could go on, but we're pressed on time. Right. Fantastic. So I'm going to go ahead and formally close our uh, Q&A session. Uh, I would 
well, would like to once again thank Steve for his tremendous insights and expertise. Thank you very much, Steve. Always a pleasure. And I'll, and I'd also like to thank our webinar partner, Senage. We appreciate their strong commitment to thought leadership, which is also evident in the great resources and content they offer, which you can view by visiting the High Radius website. I want to remind all of you that you'll be able to request to get connected with our featured speaker, Steve Player, and our sponsor via a few mouse clicks in the survey, which will launch right after the conclusion of the webinar. Appreciate your consideration in taking that survey. And finally, to you, our audience, thank you so much for your valuable time today. Please let us know what we can do better and make the rest of your day great, everyone.